if you know what I mean. It looked as if it was all arranged. It was just, he was taking the blame and Matt was it. And... In the summer of 1985, a priest was found dead in the bedroom of a wealthy married couple. It was a story that would grip the country. The word priest and bedroom and woman, the usual rumours went around. We were hearing that, that he was having an affair. And we, we knew well he wasn't having an affair. Father Malloy's body was discovered at the luxurious residence of Mr Richard Flynn at Kilcorsey around three o'clock this morning. Gardaí are understood to have arrived at the scene shortly after a local doctor and priest had been summoned. Father Malloy had been attending celebrations to mark the wedding of a member of the Flynn family. At the subsequent trial, the judge's verdict was completely unexpected. Not guilty. I'm shocked and I'm appalled as a nephew, but also as an Irishman, that our system of justice can work in such a manner. For the family of Father Niall Malloy, the case remains an open wound. Why, after 36 years, are they still seeking closure, answers and justice? I dream about it at night time, uh, but the first thing I do every morning when I get up, I come down here, I always check on the website, see how many views there were on it yesterday, see if there were any comments left, and it keeps the extended family up to date and on, on what's happening, you know. Father Niall Malloy's nephew, Bill Marr, is the latest spokesman for the Justice for Niall campaign. His uncle Billy and brother Ian led the campaign before him. Both died without ever discovering what really happened. My late brother Ian did a lot of stuff and unfortunately uh, he died prematurely and a lot of the records were lost that he'd built up over the years so I had to start from scratch again. And thankfully with the help of the internet and other things I, I was able to build up a load of information. Niall was never Niall the priest to me. He was he was my uncle Niall. He was my favourite uncle. He'd come and read our comics myself and my brother, and he'd be one of the gang with us, you know, and dead easy going. It's a sad journey back here every year. It's another year still battling on. It's frustrating. I'm getting old. I don't know how much longer I can keep doing it. But I'll keep doing it. But it's... Um, has to be done. And it's for all of us. Whatever happened, if somebody gave him a blow to the head in the course of an argument, he was just left to die there. And I think he was lying like that, and nobody did anything. What sort of animals are they? That's all I can describe them as, animals. On July 8th, 1985, Father Niall Malloy's body was found, badly beaten, on the bedroom floor of his close friends, Richard and Teresa Flynn. Teresa and Father Niall had shared a love of horses for nearly 30 years and were in business together. The Flynns were respected in their local community at Clara, County Offaly. We grew up with the Flynns, Flynn children. We all went to school together and played football together. Richard wasn't probably as forthcoming with conversation and friendliness as much as Teresa. Uh, he'd just say what he had to say and that was about the size of it. Well, I suppose, you know, there were the, the wealthy family of the parish. That time the offerings would be read out from the altar, from the priest, you know. Most people would be given two shillings or a half a crown. Richard Flynn and the schoolmaster gave a pound. 
And then I think they were the only two people in the parish that gave a pound, you know. Richard Flynn owned a chain of motor factor shops. In 1981, he and Teresa moved to Kilcorsey House in Clara, the former home of their friends, the Good Bodies. When Kilcorsey House was for sale, Richard Flynn bought uh, the house, but he wasn't only buying um, bricks and mortar. He was also buying the provenance of the Goodbody family. It was a, seen as a trophy house. There was, I think, about 20 rooms maybe in that house big courtyard and stables and all to go with it. Mrs Flynn seemed to be a very confident woman. She was very good with horses and herself and Father Malloy kind of had a partnership in the horses and they worked well together. And uh, the story was that he was a kind of, as well as being good with them, he was a financer. So it was a business they were running together. I say one and never did anything with, without the other. Consent like they were. Corsi House. Oh yeah, he had his own private room. Everything was okayed by Father Malai. No matter what was done, he okayed it. Simple things, painting the gate or whatever. Whatever father said. <clears throat> like I say, Richard never took part in any decision making out there. Father Nile had two very different passions in life. One as a horseman at Kilcorsey, the other an hour's drive away in Roscommon as the dutiful curate of Castlecoot Parish. He was very attentive to his, both his church and his sacraments. He also was um, very attentive to the children in the school. He could nearly tell you the name of every child who was in it. He wouldn't hurt anybody. You know, that was the type of person he was. He was very reserved, quiet. He would join in with everything, but he wouldn't, let's say, go out of his way to annoy a person or he wouldn't go out of his way to say anything wrong with a person. Well, every day he would come to the shop, our shop here, for his newspaper. He was a very ordinary man. He had a great sense of humour. He was somebody you could, you know, you weren't uptight when he'd come to the door. He just brought him in and he'd sit down, it didn't matter whether he had anything on the table or not. He was very natural. There he is, here, in this room. And he looked the part. There's a certain look about something like that he had. The Flynns were occasionally seen at Castle Coote, where they were known as Father Niles' good friends. I always found them nice people, all I knew of them. Just here somewhere. Well, she was always very well groomed. She was Brennan from Galway. They had a business in Galway. Of course, when we'd be in the church, we'd be all looking and looking. Well, I knew him for 28 years. It was uh, longer than anybody else, I suppose, in the parish because 
I knew through his sister. Then when he came to Castle Court, of course, I was just so delighted. I met Therese a few times. I don't think I ever talked to Richard very much. I thought it was a wonderful thing that he met up with people that he came, that came from the same kind of a background as he did himself. And when he was very upper class, if you want, but he never, never, you, you wouldn't think that. He was uh, the chapl chaplain to the army in Athlone. He did not like the limelight at all. He would prefer to be invisible here. His father left Ireland, made a small fortune in America, came back. Money was not any object. For instance, when Niall was training to be a priest, he went to the Irish College in Rome. Usually you had to be very, very bright or have a good bit of money. Carrow House in Roscommon is a very important house, and they had a pretty top drawer childhood. This house played a big role in, in, in all our lives. It was important because uh, we all gathered here, you know, all my cousins, Christmas time, summer holidays. I got lots, lots of memories running around the fields, running around the woods. I, I would have stayed in this room, looking out over the field is more or less the same as it was. It was like a kind of a fairy story, you know. It sounds terrible, but when I saw a programme about the, the Kennedys, mm. it kind of reminded me of that and that time. Niall would be around, he was a teenager on his bicycle, probably told to keep an eye on us and so we could end up anywhere. He had his hands full looking after us all, and then he did and his leaving cert and he went to Rome and he kind of had a tough time in Rome because he thought it, my granny, our granny had died suddenly and he didn't know whether it was her vocation or whether it was his. He was ordained in 1957, I would have been seven then, so he was away a lot of the time. I would have got to know him more after that. But. There was, it was a huge occasion for Roscommon Town and there was bonfires all, in, all, all along the, the road there into the town from, from the house here when himself and his other colleague from Roscommon Town was ordained at the same time. By all accounts, Father Nile was well loved by the parishioners of Castle Coote. One of them, Johnny Gallagher, recalls an odd exchange just four days before his friend's death. I got down off the tractor and I, I went to the car and I said, are you all right? And he said, um, well, he said, I am and I am it. He said, uh, will you sit in for a few minutes? And I said, I will, of course. I said, is there anything wrong? And he said, um, well, not really, he said, but uh, I'm really not looking forward to this weekend. And I said, oh. And I said, why? Is there something wrong? Well, he said, it's a private matter. He said, I can't discuss it with you. He said, I'm thinking of retiring. I said, are you? And I said, well, it's not a health wise. No, 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 no. He said, health has nothing at all got to do with it. Um, he said, I just want to be my own person. And at the moment, he said, I'm not. And that was all that was said about it. Well, I said, if there's anything that I can do in way of help, I said, you know where I am. He, he said, there's nothing you can do. The conversation took place before a family wedding hosted by the Flynns at Clara, a two-day celebration that Father Nile would attend between his parish duties. In the cash-strapped 1980s, it was a grand occasion. Maureen Flynn was marrying Ralph Parks, who was one of the Parks of Limerick, High Flyers. You had a lot of colour. You had high society. You had the big house. It would have been unusual for a house to have enough room on the grounds for a marquee, so there was a marquee. The, uh, the caterers came out, I think, from the um, Bridge House in Tullamore, and uh, there were 
uh, various people at it. The notable ones would have been uh, Brian Lanahan and his wife, Anne, and uh, Douglas Goodbody, actually, and his wife, Anne de Montmorency Armstrong Lushington Tullock, otherwise known as Anne Goodbody. I remember Brian Lanahan pulling a pint for himself. He said, sure, there's no one else pulling it, he might as well do it himself. <laughs> Despite his closeness with the Flynn family, Father Nile wasn't the celebrant at the wedding on Saturday, as he was marrying another couple at Castle Coot. He arrived later that evening. So he came in to the meal, or after the meal was over, and he moved round, he met all the people, and shook hands, and everything looked normal. In July 1985, for most of the weekend that would culminate in his death, Father Niall Malloy was at his parish in Castle Coote. He married a local couple on the Saturday and said Mass on Sunday, stopping by to visit friends before he left for Clara. Can you see the Bishop of the Bride's dress? That's the wedding that was here on the Saturday before he died. Isn't that lovely, that picture? He was here on that Sunday on his way to Clara. He popped in here that day. Sunday morning, he had mass here. He said that he was, uh, he was going up to Kilcorsey and that the wedding thing was still going on. There was going to be a luncheon and he was going up for that. He went away smiling. I can still see him smiling, going off for himself, happy. And that was it. Never saw him again. Father Nile drove to the post-wedding luncheon in Clara. According to statements given by the Flynn family and other guests, he arrived around 2 p.m. The last guests were gone by 7 p.m., at which point Father Nile and Richard and Teresa Flynn went to a friend's house for drinks. Sometime between 9 and 9.45 p.m., all three returned to Kilcorsey. Sometime in the following hours, Father Niall Malloy would die, but the precise details of when and how are in doubt. And that doubt has tormented the Malloy family ever since. Around 1 a.m., Clara Parish priest Father Dignan received a phone call from Richard Flynn, asking him to come to Kilcorsey and be prepared to anoint a person. On arrival, Father Dignan administered the last rites to a man lying on the Flynn's bedroom floor, whom he couldn't say was dead or alive. Shortly afterwards, other members of the Flynn family arrived at the house. Around 2 a.m., family GP Dr. O'Sullivan arrived at Kilcorsey, where he pronounced Father Malloy dead. Finding Teresa Flynn in a state of hysteria on the bedroom floor, he treated her and drove her to Tullamore Hospital. Finally, at 3.15 a.m., Father Dignan called to Clara Garda Station to report the incident to Sergeant Kevin Ford. Just drove in and parked at the, at the door. Dr. Sullivan opened the door and brought me in. And it was him that brought me upstairs to the bedroom where the priest was. I said to myself, uh, he's lying here a while, maybe. The blood was uh, on the... And I suppose it was six inches or eight inches wide, a drag mark. There was also splashes of blood on the wall just above where he was lying. Sit down and uh, have a cup of coffee. 
went down the stairs and I met Richard Flynn. We're bringing you out such an hour. Not very concerned, to be honest. It's a messy old business. He said that I did it. I'm the culprit. I'm the culprit. As you had a, a murder, you had a person admitting to it without any qualms. To this day, Richard Flynn's conversation with Sergeant Ford remains the only account of what happened to Father Niall Malloy. About midnight last night, my wife and I went to bed and Father Malloy came into our bedroom. We were all having a drink and a discussion. An argument developed between the three of us. It was a stupid argument over who would go downstairs for another drink. I refused to get a drink for my wife and Father Malloy. They both attacked me then, physically, and I struck them with my fists. I hit my wife once in the face and she fell down. I hit Father Malloy at least twice and probably three times in the face. Well, first of all, a row over someone going down for a drink. I thought that was very funny at the, at the, at, at, to, to begin with. That, that was a bit ridiculous. Both my wife and Father Malloy were rendered unconscious. I threw water on both their faces. My wife revived, but Father Malloy did not. I ran downstairs to phone the parish priest, Father Dignan. I went back upstairs and my wife, Teresa, she was in hysterics. I examined Father Malloy and he was dead. At the time, it was impossible for Sergeant Ford to corroborate Richard Flynn's account because Teresa was no longer at the house. She was in the hospital. She had been brought to hospital before that, before I went down. Uh, Dr Sullivan was treating her and they thought it best to get her into hospital because she was hysterical and that was his words. So I didn't see her at all. And then the technical bureau arrived and the... the, the, the Investigation crew arrived and they took over, and that was that was as far as my involvement was. Within hours, the Garda Technical Bureau began a full investigation. Richard Flynn's solicitor also arrived and declined permission for the Flynn family to be interviewed by Gardi. In due course, he would deliver prepared statements. The law, as it stood in 1985, only allowed for arrest and detention if a firearm had been used. Later that morning, hearing news of Father Malloy's death, the Flynn's neighbour, Brian Sheridan, called to Kilcorsey. So the minute I heard he was dead, I over the pen and across to the house, in the back door, two guards standing on the stairs. This is a crime scene, you can't go any further. But Richard's in there, you want to see him in the kitchen? I goes into Richard's and... See that? I hear me. <laughs> I'm sure. That was just his story, right? I didn't know what to say. My first reaction, you told me the Did children you? and... Um, yeah. I I remember thinking to myself, wasn't as lucky that he wasn't on his own, he was with friends. If the ground opened and swallowed me, that's the way that I felt. I just felt as if I had lost a member of our own family. Like that was as close as Niall was to any member of our family. Niall, in our view, was a very fit man. He was tall, he, he was not carrying any excess weight. The only thought that anyone could have was that maybe he'd fallen from a horse or something, you know, was there something like that? Or there was no reference to a car crash or anything like that, but that it was a sudden death, which was inexplicable to us, you know. We phoned Kilcorsey. We, we just said, what happened? 
and one of the daughters answered the phone and she said, uh, Mammy's in hospital, Daddy's in bed and Father Niles remains is in the, in the bedroom. That's all we heard and that was enough because we were finished. We knew then it was, you know, it wasn't, that it was true that he was dead. Around lunchtime, state pathologist Dr John Harbison arrived at Kilcorsey. After a full examination, Father Niall's body was taken to Tullamore Hospital. At the post-mortem, Dr Harbison noted six different injuries to Father Niall's head including a deep cut on the lower jaw, lacerations around the mouth and a badly bruised face. Crucially, none of his wounds suggested he'd struck anyone or defended himself. Elsewhere in the hospital, Father Niall's best friend, Teresa Flynn, was receiving medical attention for severe trauma with amnesia. The following day, she agreed to talk to Gardi about what had happened. She claimed she had gone to bed early because she was tired, later waking to find her husband in bed beside her, chatting with Father Malloy, who was sitting at the foot of the bed. Next, she recalled seeing Father Malloy's body on the bedroom floor. She felt his arm for a pulse, but found none. She gave him the kiss of life, and that was all she could remember. In an interview, the dead priest's brother spoke of his encounter with Mr. Flynn soon after the death of Father Malloy. I noticed here that there may be a bone fractured or broken, that the hand was all swelled, and the knuckles here under the... Sorry. Under the nails. Under the nails was all blood clotted. I just grabbed his hand, I said, is that the hand that hit my brother? He said, yes. It was the first time ever I saw my dad cry that day. The daddy I knew before that was different than what came home from Tullamore, from Kilcourcy House that night. He was a man set on, he wanted answers and that's it. And of course it was everyone's fault that he had no answers. While the results of the post-mortem on Roscommon curate Father Niall Malloy are still awaited, he'll be buried today after concelebrated mass at Castle Coote Church. It was a, a sombre, silent affair. And it was heartbreaking to be on the gallery in a choir when you knew who was on the floor. You know, I have attended very tough funerals in that church, but I never, never will forget that morning. There was someone sitting in the front seat, so I, I didn't know who he was. All because he was at the back of his head, and I said, because I'm not to flinch myself. And then he walked up afterwards, and I said, that's the, him, so. And as he left the church then, there was a scuffle with photographers outside. We had more newspapers arrived here looking for interviews to us to know what happened, but we didn't know what happened. But there was, there was rumours going around. I mean, I remember talking to a, a reporter. I said, where, where did all these rumours start? And he said, oh, that, was, that came from a waitress in the bridge house in Tullamore. We were all having breakfast there one day. And he said, oh, sure. she said, oh, sure, they were having it off, you know. And he said it, it took legs from that. There was British media and everything there. We were hearing that, that he was having an affair. And we, we knew well he wasn't having an affair. How important was he in the, to the life of the community here? He was the greatest man that ever could come into this parish. To well, he's a big around. loss. We all miss him very much. And um, I don't think we'd ever get anybody like him again. His name sh shouldn't go down in history as this Playboy thing that they, you know, 
he was a good priest. When we look back on our family, we would have found priests, missionaries, nuns, all in our house, and then suddenly they pulled back from us. And that hurt a lot. And where, where do you go when you're in pain? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's possible that, that, that back then in, in, in the 1980s, um, you know, uh, people kept, you know, probably kept their heads down to avoid getting caught in the crossfire, whatever the crossfire might have been. On July the 8th last, the body of Father Niall Malloy was found against a bedroom door at the home of Mr and Mrs Richard Flynn near Clara in County Offaly. The case has provoked widespread rumour and innuendo, none of it in any way substantiated. And the delay in resolving the case, one way or the other, has naturally caused deep upset both to the Flynn and Malloy families. The Garda investigation into the case was completed over a fortnight ago, and the Garda file has since been with the Director of Public Prosecutions. I don't think the investigation was up to scratch, really. You know, there was, there was a lot of things that weren't done and could have come up with information which could have made them turn in a different direction. The fact that, that he was admitting it, uh, that he did it and ready to go to court and admit it. In one uh, sense, it's very hard to ignore that. But then if you do a little bit of probing here and there, you could come up with something to cast a bit of doubt on what he was saying. I was the nearest neighbour at the time across the hedge and sure no one spoke to me about it until 30 years later. Like usually if there's a murder or anything, everyone is interviewed. The week after the funeral, uh, my cousin received confirmation that Niall had been in contact with the solicitor on a number of occasions. Very concerned about um, his finances and very worried about money that was due to him. Subsequently, the Gardaí were made aware of that fact and they called to the solicitor to discuss by virtue of the fact that there were difficulties there in Niall's life which we hadn't known about. Um, which were inextricably tied in with his death. His idea that weekend wasn't just to go up to the party. It was his idea to, to go there to get his finances sorted out. And that was the main cause of Niall's death. I think I can speak on behalf of all the people in the parish that it's a blow that I don't think we will ever come out of. We wanted justice for Niall. And that's why we were there. What do you believe happened? I don't know what happened. I honest and truly don't know what happened, but I would like to see a, a truthful outcome come out of this. Mr. Flynn, seen here on the right, had been summoned to appear on two charges, alleging that between 9 p.m. on July 7th and 2.30 a.m. on July 8th last, he unlawfully killed Father Malloy at Kilcorsi and assaulted him, causing him actual bodily harm. In the months after Father Niall's death, there were several pre-trial hearings, but what was initially seen as an open and shut case was slower to proceed than his family and friends had expected. We scored the court cases. And every time it was a Jordan and a Jordan and a Jordan and me. Well, we didn't know what was going on. And loads of pictures of us sitting of us, the whole lot was going into the court. You think we were going to be able to get justice? And we'd come home then heartbroken because there was nothing done. A Jordan to the next day. And we'd go again, and it was the same thing. Mr. Flynn left immediately after the hearing, accompanied by his solicitor, and made his way through waiting photographers and onlookers to his car. The trial has begun in the Dublin Circuit Criminal Court of the County Offaly businessman Richard Flynn, who was accused of the manslaughter of Father Niall Malloy last July. Remember that day of the trial quite clearly. We honestly thought this would be 
the start of a road to justice, you know. Jean Kerrigan from McGill magazine was one of the journalists attending the trial. One expects that when somebody dies violently, there will be some satisfaction of at least the family as to how their relative died. People wanted to know, what the hell was this about? There was, I don't think there was much doubt at all that uh, Richard Flynn was guilty. It, it was a, a classic kind of open and shut case. And they had a, a dead body, you had a guy downstairs with bruises on his knuckles, and the first thing he says to the police is, I'm the culprit. Mr Flynn, aged 47, from Kilcorsey House, Clara County, Offaly, has pleaded not guilty to the unlawful killing of Father Malloy at his home last July. ...he had used in other cases before Judge Rowe. In this case, his key witness would be state pathologist Dr John Harbison. I know that you favour the view that Father Malloy died as a result of head injuries. Yes, my lord. But I have to suggest to you, whilst I know you don't favour it, that you cannot dispose of the possibility that death was caused by acute heart failure not necessarily related to trauma. I could certainly say that a cardiac condition could have contributed to his death, my lord, um, but I can't ignore the brain injuries. There's no evidence of any kind of uh, heart attack. Um, but there was degeneration of the heart, and that gave an opening to Paddy McEntee. Having introduced Father Nile's heart defect as a possible cause of death, McEntee also asserted that Richard Flynn could not be charged with assault as he had acted in self-defence. He then asked Judge Rowe to remove the jury so he could advance his case. I was expecting a big you know, case with the jury there and that they'd make the decision, but this fellow decided no. What happened next was the last thing anyone attending the trial had expected. Ladies and gentlemen, the case has come to an end in your absence and accordingly, I am directing you to bring in a verdict of not guilty on both counts. And it was over. There was quite some shock in the courtroom. On June 12th, 1986, Richard Flynn left the court a free man. And Richard Flynn passed by with a smirk on his face. And if I could have reached him. It was over, just completely over. Why he did it, who knows? I'm shocked and I'm appalled as a nephew, but also as an Irishman. That our system of justice can work in such a manner. It's frightening. There was surprise uh, that the judge had issued a direction so quickly. Uh, there was surprise that the jury hadn't been given the opportunity uh, to, to hear the evidence. Mystification, I would say, about that. No statement about the fact that this man had been calling in very concerned about considerable monies which he had given and he couldn't get back. The family felt we have told the authorities, the state are looking after all of this, we don't interfere, as they will do their job, they will prosecute. Look at what happened. Brian, I'm not going to comment one way or the other on, on the result of the, uh, the court's uh, treatment of the matter. Uh, I'm not a court. Uh, this isn't indeed a court. What I do think, though, uh, I should point out is that the law provides in a case like this, uh, in the case of a death that is unexplained, the law provides for a public sworn inquiry uh, to establish the cause and the circumstances of the death. Uh, that's a coroner's inquest.
to get to get a verdict that my uncle was that died as a result of injuries to his head. We're very pleased with that. This is the verdict that we came here to find out. How different things might have been if the inquest had been held first and the trial second. Um, because in a nutshell then I think the trial judge's hands would have been tied by the verdict of the jury at the coroner's inquest and um, we would have had a full trial, full hearing and the matter put to the jury. At the conclusion of the inquest, Deputy Coroner Brian Mahan stated, There are a number of unexplained mysteries in this case. I can only believe that something gave rise to that eruption of anger by one, two or all of those present, and this inquiry has not been told what that was. Outside the coroner's court, Richard and Teresa's son David spoke to the gathered media. On behalf of the Finn family and myself, we would like to express regret and sympathy to the Malloy family and to Father Malloy's parishioners. Did your family find it uh, uh, very difficult to, to handle the rumours and, and speculation that surrounded this case? Extremely difficult. It's very difficult, maybe, when one knows certain answers and isn't in a position to comment. It makes it very difficult to live with. That's the only public statement I'm aware of the Flint's ever, any of the Flint's ever made to the media. Well, it's basically saying that, you know, extremely difficult, it's very difficult, maybe when one knows certain answers and isn't in a position to comment, it makes it very difficult to live with. Only he can explain that comment. We're looking for answers and, and we're, we're looking for people to be held accountable who have refused to speak and are still walking around the streets today. I won't give up. And the next generation, if I kick the bucket, will continue on what I'm doing. Some people did engage with us, a uh, considerable number of other people declined to engage. Blood distribution, it's factual evidence. It doesn't make a mistake. It's not excited. So something doesn't add up in this picture, really. The post-mortem report, it, it just wasn't quite clear-cut to me. I, I had heard about Teresa Flynn claiming previously that she was his sister. It does raise alarm bells. And you can catch the second part of this documentary next Monday at 9.35. 20 years later, we hear the accounts of 13 people whose lives were changed forever when the US was attacked by terrorists. That's surviving 9-11 tomorrow at 10 past 11.